2015 has also been a, a news packed year on foreign matters as well. And I'm delighted to be joined by um, two fantastic writers who have written on this for the spectator Douglas Murray and Peter Hitchens. Douglas, I'll begin with you. What has been the most striking event outside of these aisles this year? We've seen the rise of ISIS. We've seen Russia go through various permutations of our relationship, which seems to have gone cold and then gone warm again. Uh, and of course, we've got the European Union as well with the referendum on the horizon. What single most thing has been the most significant in 2015? It's very hard to single the one thing out. I'd say that there's one big story that has had a lot of knock-on effects, and that is uh, Syria. Two things in particular are so striking about it. One is that it has exposed all sorts of things about the so-called international community and exposed a whole set of power relationships and regional and, and global uh, competitions and rivalries and dislikes and more, uh, and that's that the Syrian civil war has been able to end up, you know, becoming a rather troubling, almost hot war uh, between other countries as well. Uh, it's thrown up most recently problems between Turkey and Russia, but has thrown up problems almost between uh, and towards almost all countries. Um, that's the first thing I would say. This is the, the other thing that obviously follows on from that, and it's not by any means, as I've written many times in the year for The Spectator, not by any means only a Syrian problem, but the refugee uh, migrant crisis certainly has a substantial Syrian component. And um, that is something that now has, of course, huge, huge effects across the continent of Europe. Well, Peter Hitchens, one, the terrorist attacks in Paris um, a few weeks ago have had a huge effect, well, apparently seemed to have, on our policy towards ISIS, and the um, MPs voted to vote to bomb Syria in, in ISIS in Syria, sorry, even though they were already bombing them in Iraq. How do you see the fight against this developing in 2016? Well, this is the politics of the non sequitur. Uh, there's, there's no known connection that I've ever seen established between the events in Paris perpetrated, as these almost <coughs> always are, uh, by groups of cannabis-smoking drifters, uh, and the, the, the so-called Islamic State. And I don't know quite why we're so anxious to globalize and, as Simon Jenkins puts it, nationalize these criminal events, uh, which are fundamentally criminal, and turn them in, into political pretexts for doing things uh, that we in many cases don't want to do. Of course, that answers the question. There are some people who want to do those things anyway. Though what the purpose of British foreign policy is in Syria and the Middle East is quite hard to discover. Uh, it's very difficult to work out why it is that a government which was so anxious to intervene in Syria for reason A uh, now is equally anxious to intervene in Syria for reason B, which is totally different for reason A, except that it may be possible that reason B is actually much more like reason A than we thought it was, which is a discussion one could have. One hears all kinds of suggestions about what the purpose of this bombing is and who will actually be targeted by it, which might make the two more similar. But it, the mystery of our foreign policy in, in the Middle East is, is, is answerable only by conjecture, the, the obvious conjecture being our desire to remain on more than friendly, uh, almost sycophantic terms with Saudi Arabia, uh, which along with China is probably the most interesting country in the world at the moment. Well, I'd just say that in relation to that, uh, I wrote in the, in the magazine very early this year, I think, that, that any country that actually does suffer an assault uh, from ISIS or from ISIS-controlled territory that appears to have been planned from ISIS-controlled territory with people trained in ISIS-controlled territory is a legitimate, uh, um, does present a legitimate case for any country uh, to go and revenge itself uh, on the people who perpetrated that and who planned it. And I'm, I'm very glad that the French government uh, realises that this is an entirely legitimate exercise. I think why the British government joined in, why the British planes, a few British planes joined in, is a, is a slightly curious question. I think Peter and I would agree on this, that, that effectively what we saw the other week in Parliament was, was a very grandiose debate about doing very little. Um, nevertheless, um, showing international allegiance and alliance and, and indeed solidarity um, between countries is an important thing. And uh, there certainly was and remains very little point in, in bombing a group like ISIS on one side of a non-existent border but not on the other.
Well, that raises the question of why there was any point in bombing it on the other side in the first place. But the, the, I sometimes think of writing a book called What Happened to Al-Qaeda, uh, an organization which used to hold in the, in the public mind the same status as ISIS, uh, the huge James Bond-style bogeyman controlling from some cave uh, millions of, of, of loyal servants who went out and committed coordinated terrorist act actions against the West. It, it never existed. Uh, it's now ceased to exist and has been replaced by ISIS. Does ISIS exist? in the way in which we imagine it to be. Yes, of course the Islamic State exists in its bases in Iraq and Syria and in the area that it controls. But the connections that we make between it and what happened in San Bernardino, what happened in Paris, what happened on the talis between Amsterdam and Paris are, seem to me to be largely unsupported by fact uh, and to be, uh, and to be the, the, the product of a desire to believe in a central conspiracy against us which right. doesn't actually exist. Well, there isn't a conspiracy against us. There are certainly groups that wish us harm. What happened to Al Qaeda is quite a straightforward answer. Um, uh, what happened to Al Qaeda is a, from rather preemptively going off and destroying the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on 9 11, the United States woke up to the problem, spent more than a decade decimating the organization, pulling it apart. Drone strikes were used against it, many, many other things that made it effectively by this date and by the last few years fairly operationally incapable. Uh, the ISIS undoubtedly stepped well, that's in. Like, that's, in that's, the, like the, in that's like the pagan priests who sl slaughter a, a heifer when there's a flood and the flood goes down and say oh, well, the flood went down because we slaughtered the heifer. They're trying to establish an actual causal link between the activity of the United States and any decline in, in the terrorist threat would seem to me to be extremely difficult, not least because the terrorist threat has not declined. Well, what I was going to say was it certainly has declined from an al-Qaeda threat, but undoubtedly, as always happens, another group in the Islamist sphere tries to step into the, into the fold. That's what we've seen this year. Is, is, is ISIS becoming the the, 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 the the group which, if you're somebody inclined to that particular ideology and that kind of uh, radicalism, you you would uh, you would join. So, uh, but I agree there is well, there's something in that, that that is certainly true of what you say, which is that there are, as it were, two types of attack. One might one might boil it down to that ISIS and ISIS-like groups and previously Al-Qaeda-like groups can can encourage. One is one is a, a, attacks which have certainly happened and which are, I have to say, of less concern, which are inspired attacks, a, attacks um, carried out, perpetrated by people around the world uh, because they, um, they, they want to do them and they then claim allegiance uh, to a state. The more troubling one, which there are certainly cases of in Tunisia, the massacre in Tunisia earlier this year um, of British tourists, is one of them, it is much more troubling, is people who have been trained uh, by terrorist groups and who then travel elsewhere in the world to perpetrate them. Because if you, if you analyse... You sit in this, this, this training, I'm not saying that it hasn't necessarily taken place, but it, it's often referred to in reports afterwards. And then search as one may, one never finds any details of, of, of what it was, uh, who provided it, where it took place, when it took place. It's asserted over and over and over again. Now, I have to point out another small thing. It, it doesn't actually require very much training to massacre unarmed holidaymakers on a beach if you have a gun. It's not something for which people require much in the way of training. It doesn't, you know, if you want to burst into a theatre in Paris with, a, with an AK-47 and murder a lot of people, training is not what you need. You need to sacrifice entirely your humanity. You need to have something seriously wrong with you, but you don't need to be trained. And there's this, this attribution of training to what is actually just crude mass murder yeah. by people who have taken leave of their senses it seems to me to be a curious thing which people keep well, saying and doesn't get backed up, as far as I've ever seen, by detailed facts of where, when, who and how. Uh, i I'll give you an example of that. The, um, uh, undoubtedly some people who do this are not trained or not very well trained and as a result cannot kill as many people as they might like. But the uh, attacks in Paris in January, the first attacks of this year, uh, in particular the attack on the offices of Charlie Hebdo, was by people trained uh, in the Yemen. And one of the reasons why we, why actually it, it certainly is clear they were trained is they knew exactly what to do in order to get into the office, exactly uh, how to uh, intimidate somebody at the door who had a fob key and to hold a gun to her and her child's head and tell them that if they didn't open the fob then they'd be shot. And this is actually not the sort of thing that untrained gunmen do. Untrained gunmen tend to uh, go off and uh, not think things through, not think of the broader picture for it. That was an occasion when there was a very concerted aim, a very concerted uh, uh, effort made, uh, with a very um, bloody result.
Um, if I can just dive in, I'd like to just come on to Russia as well, because I think that's been a very interesting thing to see this year. And we've got, um, we've had the, the, the Syria International Coalition, whatever it's called, the meeting in New York, to try and agree some kind of ceasefire here. Um, looking back from where we are now, Douglas, at the beginning of the year, what would you say the relationship has changed between the West and Vladimir Putin? Oh, I, I, well, Peter knows this far better than I. I would say that I think your characterization earlier is in, is in that relations between us and Russia have become warm is... Well, maybe sort of cold and then warm and then cold. It's, it's, I think it's you changed. Meant, I think you meant warmer. <laughs> very, very slightly, but in fractional degrees. Yes. I think one of the problems was that there was never any substantial disagreement between us and Russia in the first place. And that there was no, it, there was no particularly between Britain and Russia, there was absolutely no conflict of interest. It doesn't matter to us whether Crimea is a Russian or a Ukrainian possession. Uh, and it, 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 there was never any reason why it should have mattered, nor uh, sh should it have mattered to us whether the European Union advanced its political agenda into Ukraine and removed it from the from position of neutrality that it was previously into and to, to be an aligned state. I have never been able to understand what the British interest was in, in this, though one does see what an American interest might be. So what, what was the quarrel? But it wasn't a major quarrel in the first place. The, the major quarrel in the first place arose from the fact that Vladimir Putin opposed the original American attempt to deploy military force in Syria against the Assad regime. Uh, which it did, and therefore frustrated a major American policy. And it's, it's been seriously argued by serious people that the subsequent trouble in Ukraine was not exactly an American revenge for this, but an, an American answer to this, knowing perfectly well that making trouble in the Ukraine is the best way of telling the Kremlin that you've gone too far. That's now been superseded by other things, and it, it's, it's ceased to be so important. I think one of the consequences of this will be a de facto recognition by the West of what is undoubtedly the case, that is to say Russia will remain in possession of Crimea for the foreseeable the future and Ukraine will not get it back. As for the rest of the Ukrainian mess, uh, the, the idea that, that Russia wanted to seize large chunks of, of eastern Ukraine was always a myth. It never has and it, 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 it can't afford it if, it if it did want to. So I think perhaps it will just allow people to skate past the difficulty. The other problem that the, the, the West, as we call it, faces is that Turkey, supposedly an ally, has proved to be far from an ally and, in, in fact, a considerable nuisance to us. And in, in, as we recalibrate our relations with Mr. Erdogan, who is in many ways much nastier than Mr. Putin, which is saying quite a lot, uh, we will probably have to recalibrate our relations with Mr. Putin as well. And then the other final thing, Douglas, as well, of course, has been our relationship with Europe, which, as you mentioned, the migrant crisis before. It now looks like we're going to have that in-out EU referendum in 2016. Um, if you give 17. you... Or before 2017, I think a lot of people think it's going to be in 2016. Um, on that basis, how do you think Britain's relationship with Europe has changed this year? You know, because I think people, we heard Sir John Major saying this week that if we weren't in Europe, then Calais would have been much, much worse. The French wouldn't have held migrants back. So how do you see that part of it shifting off? Final thing. Yes, as like uh, Alan Johnson said, that we would be far more susceptible to a terrorist attack if we weren't in the EU and, and, and so on. There's going to be a lot of this sort of thing said in the coming months. And I would imagine that almost everybody from political establishment from all the main parties um, will take part in this exercise of scaring the British people. Um, and uh, my own suspicion is that it will work um, and that a, a whole heap of dung being poured on the Eurosceptic, as it were, camp uh, will succeed in frightening the British people. And then finally, I'd like to ask you both, as with everyone else, a your person of 2015, someone who has symbolised the year for you. Peter? I think it has to be Vladimir Putin, the man who has succeeded in almost all his, uh, his foreign policy aims uh, by behaving uh, rationally in the interests of his own country, which seems to be a rather rare thing in, in uh, major world leaders these days. And Douglas? Is it person of the year? Is it, does it have to be somebody one admires or just the person who is... Uh, I think a person as well, as I said, Rod did earlier on, chose Diane Abbott, and I don't think Rod... There's Rod's so many admiration in this. I, I don't <laughs> admire anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think obviously the person of the year has to be um, Angela Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, Muti Merkel, um, because this is somebody who has done something this year which is going to have reverberations for decades and decades to come. She behaved um, earlier this year, as somebody said, um, like one of those um, teenagers you sometimes read about uh, whose parents are away for the weekend and uh, suddenly announces on Facebook that they've got a free house and would anyone like to come for a party? And then they do, and then the police are called a few uh, hours later and the whole thing gets shut down. Uh, Angela Merkel 
has done something this year that is, is truly extraordinary. I think it's historic, I think it's psychological. Uh, opening the doors of Germany and allowing now a million people to come into Germany, uh, who they have almost no idea who they are. Almost none. Isn't this proof um, that these people don't actually know what they do? Yes, she we, absolutely. We think that yeah. we have grown ups in charge of, of, of national governments. Yeah. Actually, they're not. They're just like us, if not worse. Yes. They haven't a clue. And I think, and I think, for that reason, she has to be said to be symptomatic, uh, and the person of the year uh, for me for 2015.